managed to drink from whatever water source was handy without giving much thought to its safety. Technological advances were aimed mostly at making access to water more convenient. After centuries of progress, finally, in the late 19th century, a remarkable thing happened. People were able to turn on a faucet within a building and water would flow out. This welcome convenience brought with it an unintended consequence. You see, this same plumbing that brings good water into the wash basin is also a means by which contaminants can flow back into the public water supply. And it wasn't long until this happened. Incidents of cross-connection began to be reported as early as the turn of the century. In 1933, at the Chicago World's Fair, 98 people died and thousands more were hospitalized when amoebic dysentery and sewage backflowed into the water mains. In 1944, in Los Angeles, harbor water was pumped into the fresh water supply of a ship. In outbreaks of Legionnaire's disease, beginning with the 1976 incident at a Philadelphia hotel, backflow was strongly suspected to be a contributing factor. Every year, incidents of cross-connection cause inconvenience, illness, and in all too many cases, death. For us to minimize these cross-connection problems, we must first better understand how they happen. Water always seeks a lower level. To get there, all it needs is something like this. It's called siphoning, a common phenomenon wherever fluids and gravity are found. And notice there's another hose in this water, a hose that's connected directly to the public water supply. Now, what would happen if the water was turned off for, uh, well, let's say, repairs on the water main? The dog water would be drawn through the wash basin hose and back out through the faucet, just like it flowed through the siphon hose. The dog water now would be in the water main, or public water supply. So, where might that water end up? Now, every time you read a newspaper, there's something else you're not supposed to have. And almost always, it's something I like. <laughs> Seems like the only thing that's safe anymore is water. Oh. Marge, I think there's a flea in my water. A what? A flea in my water. Oh, my. Look at what's in my glass. Oh, my God. They came out of my foot. Though unpleasant, fleas in drinking water is not one of the more dangerous consequences of a cross-connection. Consider this. What would happen if pesticide or fertilizer residue collected in this sprinkler head? Nothing, most of the time. Except if a construction crew broke a water main, water pressure would then drop and the pesticide could be siphoned back into the public water supply. Now, this could be fatal. But fortunately, it is easily prevented with a vacuum breaker. A vacuum breaker is basically an air vent installed in a fitting that's mounted higher than any other point downstream. There are two types of vacuum breakers, an atmospheric and a pressure vacuum breaker. Though mechanically different, they work on the same principle, that their air vent is forced closed by the pressure of water flowing through the assembly. But what would happen if, um, well, say that construction crew broke a water main again, or a fire hydrant was opened? The inlet valve would open, letting air into the line and breaking the vacuum so that no water or pesticide could be siphoned backwards through this vacuum breaker assembly. It's simple. It works. But what would happen, say, at a tall building where the water was under pressure? Buildings like these need booster pumps to get water to the top floors. The booster pump can create pressure in the water pipes that may be greater than the pressure in the public water mains. So to prevent this greater pressure from creating backflow, at the service connection of some buildings, you'll find a double check valve assembly. Water pressure forces spring-loaded valves open in the normal direction of flows so everyone can wash their hands and flush their toilets. But if for whatever reason the water became polluted in the building and the pressure from the booster pumps ever created the potential for backflow, look what would happen. The one-way check valves would be forced closed so, even in situations where one of the check valves was held open by, uh, oh, say, sediment or rust particles caught on the valve seat, only a small amount of backflow could ever get through. 
A double-checked valve assembly can only be used to protect against aesthetically objectionable materials. Uh, well, that is, not dangerous to our health. At a hospital or a manufacturing plant, materials that could be hazardous to health could backflow. Here, a reduced pressure principle assembly is necessary. This assembly also contains two check valves. The difference is that they are augmented by a differential pressure relief valve. This spring-loaded relief valve is forced closed by normal water pressure, so water flows right past it. But look what would happen if, for whatever reasons, the water is back-pressured through a leaking second check valve. Well, the differential pressure relief valve would open, creating an opening in the center chamber, draining the water completely out of the assembly, and thus, never reaching the first check valve. Any substance that somehow made it past this check valve would now flow harmlessly through the opening and completely out of the assembly. This reduced pressure principle assembly is almost fail-safe. However, any mechanical device is subject to failure, so an extra measure of protection is necessary in certain applications. Anytime we're dealing with sewage, there may be highly toxic chemicals or lethal viruses present. In this situation, the only acceptable backflow prevention is a complete break or an air gap. Water flows through the air into a reservoir, thus ensuring the hazardous material never reaches the clean water supply. Air gaps are simple, effective, and you see them applied every day. Remember that old-fashioned bathroom I showed you earlier? Look what happens when the bathtub is filled up. This water, that's now in direct contact with the public water supply, is also in direct contact with the drain. And we all know where that goes. The sewer. So what have we done? We've just cross-connected the sewer with the public water supply. Well, they don't make them like they used to. If you fill a modern wash basin all the way up, you'll find that the water level never reaches the nozzle of the faucet. Now there. That's an air gap, and for years, plumbing codes have mandated that every sink must have this air gap. Backflow prevention is now so effective that most people think nothing of taking a drink from whatever water source is handy, without giving much thought to its safety. Convenient? Yes. But it has created an unintended consequence for those people who are trying to protect us from the hazards of backflow. I've never heard of these kinds of problems you're telling me about, and we've certainly never had them here. Well, your current building already has the necessary assemblies to prevent backflow problems. And that's all we're asking you to do in your new facility. How do I know they're really necessary? Human life's at stake, so we have to take reasonable precautions. So what's the least expensive assembly I can buy? It's not that simple. The assembly must be matched to the application and its potential hazard. Knowing which assembly to use in any specific application means that our technology must be augmented with a system for establishing standards. <laughs> no problem. There are volumes on the subject. There's even a standard reference source called the Manual of Cross-Connection Control, published at the University of Southern California by the Foundation for Cross-Connection Control and Hydraulic Research. Local governments around the world refer to this manual in their plumbing and building codes. But, what good are standards on paper without an impartial means to certify which assemblies measure up to those standards? It's no small job certifying every backflow assembly on the market. But it's done right here, at a University of Southern California laboratory, operated by the same foundation that publishes the blue manual I was telling you about. This is the only lab in the world that tests assemblies both in the laboratory and in the field. Assemblies that pass are included in the list of approved assemblies. So now, with technology, standards, and impartial approval, you may assume that we have everything we need to control backflow problems. But you wouldn't be quite right. All of our people are well trained and very careful. I have no reason to doubt that. But there's usually no way to even tell that you have a backflow problem until some damage has already been done. Well, still, you're asking me to spend a lot of money. I'm asking you to conform to existing codes. Well, how exactly are you going to know what I install in my plant? Backflow prevention is an unusual sort of activity, in that when you work hard and do everything right, nothing happens. 
And to keep nothing from happening, regular inspections are critical. In order to determine the type of backflow protection that's needed, we have to establish a degree of hazard. To do this, we need to make an on-site inspection of the water using facility. Here is where knowledge from the laboratory is conveyed into the field so that cross-connection specialists know what to look for and know how to enforce the standards that keep our water safe to drink. It's very important during your testing of the backflow prevention assembly that you read your gauge accurately. The values that you're going to be interested field in... Field technicians are also trained. They help ensure that once installed, backflow assemblies continue protecting us from pollutants and contaminants. Then once you have completed the test, we will be taking those values and analyzing that for troubleshooting. So now, we've seen how technology, standards, impartial approval, regular inspections and training all combine to help meet a very basic need. You know that's something that never ceases to amaze me? Safe drinking water is something everybody understands. Sure, but anything that increases construction costs, I have to look at very critically. All I'm asking you to do is consider the consequences. Such as? You can lose a lot more than money by cutting corners. Daddy! Oh, hi, honey. Just a second, huh? I guess we have gotten used to drinking whatever comes out of the tap without giving much thought to its safety. Mm-hmm, and it's nice we can do that, don't you think? I think we agree. Come on, honey, Mommy's waiting. When our public water supply and the health of our children are at stake, I think we can all agree that in addition to convenience, we all want the assurance that we can drink the water from any tap without having to worry about its safety. Now, if you'll excuse me, all this talking has made me very thirsty. <laughs> Let's take a look at a double check valve backflow prevention assembly, which will be referred to from this point forward as the DC. First, I'll introduce you to the various parts of the DC, 